What on earth is God doing? A survey of the Bible's theology. Christ, his story incarnate, Matthew chapter 1 through Acts chapter 1. The Apostle Paul writes that Christ came to confirm the promises given to Israel in the Old Testament. Romans 15 verse 8. For I say that Christ has become a servant to the circumcision on behalf of the truth of God to confirm the promises given to the fathers. It's not surprising to see Jesus presented to his people at his arrival on earth as the key to the fulfillment of God's redemptive and kingdom programs. As he would fulfill God's plan to save sinners, an angel told Joseph, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Another angel announced to the shepherds, Today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior. Recognizing that he would fulfill God's plans to restore his kingdom authority, wise men from the east came seeking the King of the Jews, the Messiah, the prophesied ruler who would shepherd Israel. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 6. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. The angel Gabriel announced to Mary, The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Luke 1, 32 and 33. In, the, in light of the grandeur and significance of his arrival, we might have expected a grand and royal welcome for this Savior and King. Such, we know, was not at all the case. His arrival hardly caused a ripple on either the secular or religious scene of Israel. A few shepherds, some Eastern astrologers, and a few elderly believers who rejoiced at his first appearance in the temple were the only ones who showed any enthusiasm for him. Even the exact day of his birth has been lost. The world not only failed to notice his birth, but almost most of his life. Except for being noticed as a remarkably wise child in his visit to the temple at age 12, Jesus gathered no attention whatsoever. Luke 2, 46 and 47 then after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. At the beginning of his public ministry around the age of 30, his first sermon at the local synagogue surprised everyone. Luke 4, 22. And all were speaking well of him and wondering at the gracious words which were falling from his lips. And they were saying, Is this not Joseph's son? Though he became quite popular during the first half of his public ministry, the tide of public opinion soon turned against him. Eventually, both the religious leaders and the people as a whole rejected him as a worthy candidate for the Messiah. In the end, he wound up with a price on his head and was executed as a dangerous criminal. What went wrong? Why did Israel reject their savior and king? The answer seems to lie in four things. One, the kind of Messiah Israel was seeking. Two, the message and ministry of Jesus. Three, Israel's false religious system and leadership. And four, the sovereign plan of God. One, the kind of Messiah Israel was seeking. In the previous centuries, Israel had returned from captivity in Babylon and had reestablished their nation in Palestine. They had survived the fierce attempt of Greek Syrian rulers to force them 
to reject their own religion and culture and accept Greek religion and culture instead. Israel had been forced to defend their faith both philosophically and physically against the onslaughts of paganism. Out of this struggle came the religious conservative party called the Pharisees, meaning separatists. They were conservative both in their beliefs and practices and sought to maintain purity of life and teaching through their traditions. These traditions were their interpretations of how the scriptures should be applied, and they tried to apply them vigorously to every aspect of life. The climate they created was conservatism with a vengeance. Ellison explains how their approach colored their view of the coming Messiah. This vengeful conservatism played an important part in developing their view of the Messiah. It taught them to watch for his coming to be sure, but their yearning for national vengeance blurred their vision of what to expect. Having fought the encroachments of paganism, both religious and political, they saw themselves as valiant champions of godliness and true religion. When Messiah would come, he would surely dash to their side and vindicate their cause. Like David, he would slay Goliath and rout the Philistines. As a Jewish Alexander the Great, he would destroy their enemies and catapult them into international prominence. The prophets certainly confirmed this conquering prince expectation, but it became a political fixation with them, blurring their view of the spiritual work of the Messiah. In their enthusiasm for a conquering king, Messiah, they neglected and misunderstood the importance of the suffering servant role of the Messiah and of their need to repent in order to experience the redemption he would bring. In fact, they came to view their own nation as the suffering servant of the Lord and their political need for national deliverance as overriding any spiritual need for repentance. They saw themselves as righteous in no need of repentance. So when Jesus came and presented himself to them, their view of him was preconditioned and skewed by their distorted views of both scripture and their own spiritual need. Two, the message and ministry of Jesus, his forerunner's message and ministry. John the Baptist came to prepare people for the Messiah's coming, and so he called upon them to repent in order to be ready to participate in God's kingdom. Matthew 3 1 to 12. Now in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is the one referred to by Isaiah the prophet when he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John himself had a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem was going out to him, and all Judea, and all the district around the Jordan, and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not suppose that you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these stones, God is able to raise up children to Abraham. The ax is already laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. As for me, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor. And he will gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. He came as a religious outsider to both prepare people's hearts for Christ and to introduce him to them as the Son of God who gives the Holy Spirit and the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John 1, 29 to 34. 
The next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he on behalf of whom I said, After me comes a man who has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. I did not recognize him, but so that he might be manifested to Israel, I came baptizing in water. John testified, saying, I have seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained upon him. I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, He upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. While many common people recognize their spiritual need and receive John's baptism to indicate their repentance, the religious leaders of the nation rejected John's ministry and what God intended to do through him. Luke 7, 29 and 30. When all the people and the tax collectors heard this, they acknowledged God's justice, being, having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected God's purpose for themselves, not having been baptized by John. Ellison explains how John's ministry was an essential prelude to Jesus' own ministry. This judgment ministry of John was divisive to be sure, but it was an essential prelude to Jesus' ministry. Though the Savior came to bless his people, judgment had to precede blessing. Their shallow response to the forerunner forced Jesus to take up the same cudgel himself, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Although the ministry of Jesus was basically one of joy, his purpose of seeking repentance was not diminished. In the process, however, he, like John, also received a meager response. Repentance was hard to come by in Israel. Jesus' kingdom message and ministry, his message, the Sermon on the Mount, and the conversation with Nicodemus. In describing the characteristics of the citizens of his kingdom in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus clarified true righteousness. It is not a matter of religious ritual, but of spiritual purity. Matthew 5, 1 to 12. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. In doing this, Jesus was also attacking the whole religious approach of the Pharisees. Matthew 5, 20. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. This statement would have scandalized the people of Jesus' day who regarded the Pharisees as the epitome of spirituality. But as Jesus explained to Nicodemus, himself a Pharisee, and a leading religious teacher, only a spiritual rebirth through faith in the Messiah produced the kind of righteousness necessary for the kingdom of God. John chapter 3, verses 1 to 15. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, 
he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen, and you do not accept our testimony. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. Jesus went on in the Sermon on the Mount to criticize them for majoring on the minors and forgetting essentials, for hypocritical external religious practices intended to impress other people, and for presumptuous and judgmental attitudes towards others whom they regarded as inferior. They had built their house on sand, and it would surely fall. Matthew 7, 24-27 Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house. And yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. His ministry of miracles. The miracles that Jesus performed were his messianic credentials. Matthew 11, 2-6. Now when John, while imprisoned, heard of the works of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the expected one, or shall we look for someone else? Jesus answered and said to them, Go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who does not take offense at me. John 20, 30 and 31. Therefore many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Though the common people gladly came for healing, the leaders were strangely unimpressed with Jesus' miracles. Their lack of enthusiasm became an accusation of blasphemy when Jesus used a miracle he did in their presence to prove his divine authority to forgive sins. Luke 5, 17 to 26. One day he was teaching, and there were some Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present for him to perform healing. And some men were carrying on a bed a man who was paralyzed, and they were trying to bring him in and to set him down in front of them. But not finding any way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down through the tiles with his stretcher into the middle of the crowd in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven you. The scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this man who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But Jesus Aware of their reasonings, answered and said to them, 
Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins have been forgiven you, or to say, get up and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up and pick up your stretcher and go home. Immediately he got up before them and picked up what he had been lying on and went home glorifying God. They were all struck with astonishment and began glorifying God. And they were filled with fear saying, we have seen remarkable things today. His undeniable ability to perform miracles presented them with a problem. Is not such a person with such ability the Messiah? Matthew 12 verses 22 and 23. Then a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute was brought to Jesus, and he healed him, so that the mute man spoke and saw. All the crowds were amazed and were saying, This man cannot be the son of David, can he? Their answer, Jesus was able to perform such miracles not because he was the Messiah, but because he was empowered by the devil. Matthew 12, 24. But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, This man casts out demons only by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. Ellison accurately notes, With this charge, they dogged him to the cross and shouted down any attempt to prove his messiahship by his miracles. 3. Israel's False Religious System and Leaders A False Religious System in seeking to preserve the truth of God and apply it to life, the religious leaders of Israel developed an ethical code called the Oral Law, known in Jesus' day as the Tradition of the Elders. Unfortunately, these traditions came to have more importance in their eyes than the scriptures themselves, to the point where their traditions actually caused them to disobey God. Matthew 15, 3-9. And he answered and said to them, why do you yourselves transgress the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, Honor your father and mother, and he who speaks evil of father or mother is to be put to death. But you say, Whoever says to his father or mother, Whatever I have that would help you has been given to God. He is not to honor his father or his mother. And by this, you invalidated the word of God for the sake of your tradition. You hypocrites, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. The Apostle Paul notes that their failure in so zealously pursuing righteousness was that they did not seek to attain it by faith, but rather by their own works. In seeking to create their own righteousness based on their good deeds, they refuse to accept God's righteousness, which is only available by faith in Christ. Romans 9, 30 to 10, 4. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith? But Israel, pursuing a law of righteousness, did not arrive at that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as though it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. Just as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is for their salvation. For I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Sabbath keeping was a cornerstone of their religious system. And they went to ridiculous extremes to observe it. Jesus saw their devotion to overly strict Sabbath keeping as enslaving spiritual idolatry and went out of his way to challenge it. Mark 2, 23 to 3, 6. 
And it happened that as he was passing through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples began to make their way along while picking the heads of grain, the Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need, and he and his companions became hungry? How he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar the high priest, and ate the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for anyone to eat except the priests, and he also gave it to those who were with him. Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. He entered again into a synagogue, and a man was there whose hand was withered. They were watching him to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. He said to the man with the withered hand, Get up and come forward. And he said to him, to them, Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save a life or to kill? But they kept silent. After looking around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately began conspiring with the Herodians against him as to how they might destroy him. Ellison explains why Jesus' approach caused such a negative reaction. For smashing these two idols, their traditions and their Sabbaths, Jesus was condemned by the nation. Such iconoclasm could not be condoned, for it jeopardized their whole religious structure. It eroded their legal foundation. Thus, they had no place for this Galilean maverick in their system, and he had no place for their Satan-inspired system in his kingdom program. Israel's False Religious Leaders In the end, Israel's religious leaders condemned Jesus to death for his claim to be the Christ, the Son of God. This claim they regarded as blasphemy. But from the beginning and all along the way, they had reasons for disliking him. First of all, he was an outsider, not trained in their theological schools. He came from the despised town of Nazareth in Galilee, not Jerusalem or even the province of Judea. John 1, 45 and 46. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. The second, he had little use for their treasured traditions and made no bones about saying so. His cleansing of, cleansings of the temple and his criticisms of their teachings made him seem to them like a bull in a china shop, overturning sacred traditions and threatening the religious status quo to which their positions and power were tied. John 11, 47 and 48. Therefore the chief priests and the Pharisees convened a council and were saying, What are we doing? For this man is performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, all men will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Third, his closest associates were fishermen and tax collectors, and he often enjoyed the company of lowly social outcasts, sinners. How could such a person be the holy Messiah and Son of God? Luke 15, verses 1 and 2. Now all the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near to listen to him. Both the Pharisees and scribes began to grumble, saying, This man eats with sinners and receives them. Of course, we also must recognize that Jesus rejected them. He said they were unfit for the kingdom. Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. He compared them to thieves and robbers who ravished God's flock. John 10, verse 8 and 10. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, 
But the sheep did not hear them. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. He called them children of the devil, whose hearts were filled with lying, murderous desires. John 8, 44. You are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. His final verdict on them was that they were snakes who would certainly be sentenced to hell. Matthew 23, 33. You serpents, you brood of vipers, how will you escape the sentence of hell? Is it any wonder that these false religious leaders engineered his rejection and death? 4. The Sovereign Plan of God When Christ came, he presented himself as the King of Israel. Matthew 21, verses 1 to 9. When they had approached Jerusalem and had come to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied there and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did just as Jesus had instructed them, and brought the donkey and the colt, and laid their coats on them, and he sat on their coats. Most of the crowd spread their coats in the road, and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them in the road. The crowds going ahead of him and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! However, because of their rejection of him, Israel would, for the time being, forfeit their place in the kingdom. Matthew 21, 42 to 44. Jesus said to them, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? This became the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing the fruit of it. And he who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. He would indeed return in the future and establish his glorious kingdom. Matthew 25, verses 31 to 34. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them from one another, as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For the present, the kingdom of God on earth would take quite a different form. The execution of the king of the Jews, engineered by his enemies, became the means by which God would save the world. His death was not only a tragic injustice, but a divinely ordained sacrifice, providing forgiveness of sins. Matthew 26, 26 to 28. While they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. The new covenant established by Jesus' death would become the basis of a whole new body of believers, the church which Jesus had promised to build. Matthew 16, 18. 
I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Ellison ties Israel's tragic rejection of the Messiah to the triumph of the cross and the birth of the church. The wrath and whims of men do not frustrate the purposes of God in the final analysis. Out of this apparent tragedy, God brought the spiritual triumph of the cross and the offer of salvation to all people. The immediate fruit of Messiah's rejection then was the present age of the church. But before we leave the life and ministry of Christ, let's notice how thoroughly in the sovereign plan of God Jesus' death on the cross resolved the problems created by mankind's fall into sin in the Garden of Eden. John Cross draws these conclusions and comparisons between the consequences of our sinfulness and the solutions brought to us by Jesus' death. And I will mix these consequences and how the cross deals with them together so you can see the connection between them. The consequences of our sinfulness. I am accused and found guilty of breaking God's law. How Jesus Christ deals with the consequences. God, as the perfect judge, declares me right with him, justified. He now views me as sinless. Consequences. To break God's law is sin, and my sin incurs a sin debt, a consequence I must pay. The cross. My sin debt was taken care of on the cross. The debt is gone, paid in full erased. Consequences. The debt can only be paid by my death, a payment that is made for eternity in the lake of fire. The cross. God gives me a new life both now and for all of eternity in heaven. Consequences. It is impossible for me to keep God's law perfectly. Even when I try hard, I still find myself failing. In addition, Satan manipulates me to do his will. I am a slave. The cross. Once enslaved, I have now been bought with Jesus' blood and set free. I am no longer a slave to Satan's purposes. Consequences. My sin has created a chasm, a barrier between God and me. I am a stranger. The cross. Not only am I free, but God has adopted me into his family. The great chasm caused by my sin has been removed. Consequences. When I was born into this world, I joined forces with Satan, who also sinned against God. The cross. Jesus' death and resurrection defeated Satan. I no longer belong to the devil. I have peace with God. Consequences. Having chosen my own way, I find myself in a spiritual wilderness, groping for truth. I am like a lost sheep. The cross. Jesus, as the good shepherd, has found me and given me new life, eternal life, forgiveness, purpose for living, freedom from guilt, and so much more. How then did the kingdom of God develop during the time Christ was on earth? In this section, as in all the sections on the development of the kingdom and how people were saved during a particular period of time, I'm greatly indebted to Dr. David Christensen for the use and adaptation of his material on biblical theology. One, the king was anticipated. It is clear that the New Testament writers anticipated the Messiah to be king in the normal sense of the word. They understood the Old Testament prophecies to refer to the king in the Davidic sense of royalty. The Messiah would be the fulfillment of those Old Testament prophecies of the restoration of Israel to worldwide dominion. Two, the king was selected and anointed, Matthew 3, 13 to 17. Then Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him. But John tried to prevent him, saying, I have need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answering said to him, Permit it at this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he permitted him. After being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. 
And behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as, as a dove and lighting on him. And behold, a voice out of the heavens said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. John 1, 31-34 I did not recognize him, but so that he might be manifested to Israel, I came baptizing in water. John testified, saying, I have seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained upon him. I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, He upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. The meaning of Christ's baptism was that it fulfilled all the human and spirit anointing imagery of the Old Testament. Just as the prophets physically anointed the first three kings of Israel, so John the Baptist became the New Testament kingmaker. Just as the first two kings were anointed with the Spirit, Jesus Christ was Spirit anointed to perform his messianic ministry as a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. Isaiah 42.1 and 62.1 Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. For Zion's sake I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not keep quiet, until her righteousness goes forth like brightness, and her salvation like a torch that is burning. 3. The kingdom had a spiritual basis. John chapter 3, verses 3 to 8. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. The only way to enter this kingdom was by regeneration. The kingdom was available to Israel, both individually and nationally, if she would accept the spiritual basis for this kingdom. 4. The kingdom was a present reality. Matthew 12, 28. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Luke 17, 20 and 21. Now, having been questioned by the Pharisees as to when the kingdom of God was coming, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor will they say, Look, here it is, or there it is. For behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. Although interpretation differs on these verses, it's best to understand them as teaching that the kingdom was among them in the person and work of the king. It cannot mean that the kingdom was an internal reality, spiritual indwelling, for such an idea was foreign to Judaism. Furthermore, Luke 17, 21 clearly indicates that the antecedent you is the Pharisees. The point is that the reign of God is among them in the person of the king, Jesus Christ. This is consistent with the Old Testament, where the kingdom was closely associated with the king and the kingly line. 2 Samuel 7, 12-14, Jeremiah 33, 14-22. Furthermore, in the Gospels, the term kingdom could refer to the authority or power of the king to reign, Luke 19, 12. So he said a nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then return, Matthew 16, 28. Truly, I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death, until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. 5. The kingdom was a future inheritance. At the same time, Jesus clearly taught that the kingdom was a future inheritance. 
The consummation of the kingdom was something yet future, even if the kingdom was already present in the person and work of the king. The kingdom of God had arrived in the person of the king at his first coming, but awaited the consummation at his second coming. Jesus clearly taught that there was an interval between the two events related to the kingdom. Luke 17, 20 to 25. Now, having been questioned by the Pharisees as to when the kingdom of God was coming, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor will they say, Look, here it is, or there it is. For behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. And he said to the disciples, The days will come when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. They will say to you, Look, there, look, here. Do not go away and do not run after them. For just like the lightning when it flashes out of one part of the sky shines to the other part of the sky, so will the Son of Man be in his day. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. How then were people saved during the time Jesus was on earth? For the very first time in the progressive revelation of God, we have clear statements concerning the death of Christ. In the past, there were enigmatic prophecies and unclear allusions to the death of the Messiah, but now Jesus himself teaches he must die as a ransom for many. Mark 10, 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. This was not an unexpected death at all. Jesus knew and taught about his upcoming death. John 3, verses 14 and 15. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. It was a voluntary sacrifice. John 10, verses 17 and 18. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I receive from my Father. Salvation was conditioned upon faith in Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. John's Gospel especially makes this clear in passage after passage. John chapter 1, verse 12. 3, 14 to 16, 18 and 36, chapter 5, verse 24, 6, 47, 8, 24, 11, 25 and 26, and chapter 14, verse 6. Towards the close, John explains that this was his purpose in writing the gospel. Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of, of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Faith or belief is the one responsibility of man to the message of Jesus Christ. On some occasions, repentance, a change of mind about sin, self, and the Savior, is mentioned along with faith or in place of it as a condition of forgiveness or salvation. Mark chapter 1, verses 4 and 15, chapter 6, verse 12, Luke chapter 3, verse 3, chapter 5, verse 32, chapter 13, verse 3 and 5, chapter 15, verse 7, chapter 24, verses 46 and 47. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. Repentance is the flip side of faith and inseparable from it. In the Gospels, men live or die eternally based upon their response to Jesus Christ. Do they accept him or reject him? Here, the message of salvation becomes synonymous with the person and work of Christ.